Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bringing Together Art and Science to Study Joshua Trees. This is a program of the NEA Big Read Morongo Basin. Um, we are grateful for a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts that's allowed us to do the Big Read program for a full month throughout the Morongo Basin. And to our 23 partners that have helped us put on events throughout the month, mostly online this year. Um, if you'd like to check out some of our other events, you can do so at BigReadMorongoBasin.com. And without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to Eva Soltis, our host today from Harrison House, uh, from Harrison House, coming to you live from Joshua Tree. Thank you, Marie. Thank you, and thank you for creating such a wonderful program for the community. So uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Harrison House, we're Harrison House Music, Arts, and Ecology. And we have an artist residency program, but uh, beyond that, we've started an arts and ecology center where we uh, have an experimental site for drylands permaculture, that's home scale growing food and we plant a lot of trees. We do a lot of um, earthworks. Damien Lester is our permaculture designer. And um, so, you know, have a look at our website. Um, and we are gonna be hosting a permaculture design certification course coming up next year. We've, we've done one uh, this past year. And so when Marie first brought me the book, um, that we're all reading and, and uh, talking about today um, by Juniper Harrower, um, I thought right away that the very perfect person to include in our presentation was Juniper Harrower. Um, Juniper, I first heard about through my very dear friend, and I know our mutual friend, and I'm gonna call her a mentor to me, Robin Cavalli. And when Robin was preparing a presentation to the San Bernardino County Supervisors, because after years we were really battling large scale solar in uh, San Bernardino County, she told me, um, too busy to get together, too busy to get together, we're, we're doing, I'm doing a book and I've decided that it's only going to be a picture book and it's going to be a presentation to the San Bernardino County supervisors to explain to them why it's important to not be digging up the desert. And so the illustrations for the book were all junipers. And so that was my first introduction to juniper's work. Um, and uh, I thought, well, what a wonderful thing that an artist is able to do that to affect policy. And I, at the time, really believed that that was one of the very powerful things that did sway the San Bernardino County Board of Supervisors <clears throat> for the very first time to vote against big scale solar coming to the Moronga Basin. Uh, then a few months later, we hosted our permaculture design course that Warren Brush taught and I invited Robin to be uh, one of the presenters in the course and um, Pre-publication, she actually did a presentation with words of uh, the work that she and Juniper were doing together, which eventually ended up in this book, The Desert Underground, <laughs> right? So uh, I, if you don't have it, I suggest that you look for it. Um, so that's the second time I encountered Juniper's work and who Juniper is. And it, it was a very, very beautiful, moving presentation. Um, about what goes on under the ground and why it's important to protect the desert with absolutely stunning uh, artwork by Juniper. Um, I'm going to say Dr. Harrower. I should be less, you know, less informal about that. And then the, the next time Juniper, you know, Dr. Harrower's work <laughs> crossed my path, I'm going to respect your work, um, was when a, a very longtime friend, Howie Gutstadt, Howard, who lives in the San Francisco area, who I'm going to call one of the arts cognoscenti of the Bay Area, who really goes to so many presentations, he introduced us 
together via email because uh, he thought we should get to know each other that our, our work coincided and um, I, I was immediately really happy to you know uh, have personal contact with Juniper and um, really wanted at that time to be able to invite her here to the Harrison house because her work is sort of perfect for our mission um, and what we're doing um, but I'm happy to actually have this opportunity to even work online together and to get to know you better and to get have the opportunity pr to present you know a little bit of your work here because um, I think it's a very rare thing where an artist goes so deeply into the subject matter that informs their work that it becomes um, something that really is so expressive of something that is important at the moment and that your work with Joshua Trees in particular and the desert and, and I'm going to stop and say Lab Girl um, devoted all of two pages to the desert <laughs> ecosystems and you know and sort of it didn't quite dismiss it, but said it's a very rare, rare breed of scientists that will even endeavor to study the desert um, ecosystem because there's no money in it and there's so few people that it affects. Well, we in fact know that that's not exactly true. So we, we want to sort of do a little feedback to, you know, to the author in that sense. But it's a very rare thing that um, the science informs the work, the artwork, and the artwork informs the science. And that you've been able to take such a holistic position in your life. Um, I also know that your work with Joshua Trees in particular and the, uh, how you studied uh, the human influence on the ecosystem and on climate change has now been also important to uh, uh, the scientific groups like the Center for Biological Diversity and so forth who have now influenced the California leg legislature to for one year while it's being studied put that put them on the endangered list which is really really so important so um, I want to really applaud how you've managed to um, um, I always talk about the best art being inside out uh, and how you've managed to so deeply go into the subject matter and so beautifully um, portray that as an artist because um, professionally, other, you know, among many other things, uh, Dr. Harrower teaches art at UC Santa Cruz and she has uh, founded the environmental arts production company Symbio Art Lab, which contracts with national parks, university, and the private sector to improve. Uh, impact positive environmental change. So uh, your work is very much about activism and you call it the intersection of art, ecology, activism, and policy. So uh, I also want to say that in case any of you have not had an opportunity to view uh, Dr. Harrower's video, um, The Joshua Tree Love Story, after today's presentation, it's available on our website, lewharrisonhouse.org, and uh, it'll be up through today. And so you'll have an opportunity to look at that. And what strikes me about that is not only are you a serious scientist, but you're a playful artist. So it's a real pleasure. I think after uh, Dr. Harrower's presentation about her work, we'll have um, 10 or so, 15 minutes of discussion and then we'll invite questions from our viewers as well. So thank you so much for joining us and look, looking forward to your presentation. Eva, thank you so much. That was a really, really kind um, uh, introduction and I really appreciate it. Um, I just want to check. So is my, is my video and sound coming through? Okay, good. I'm spotlighted and I'm on. All right. Um, well, thank you so much for uh, joining us today, everybody. I want you to think about um, when was the last time that you had an experience in a wild place that really broke your heart open? Um, so a time that you really experienced a connection with the more than human and a profound sense of peace that we're part of something that's really much bigger than all of us. You know, many of our human behaviors, um, especially those such as resource extraction and really our unhinged consumerism, um, they're having immense impacts on our planet right now. 
Um, as I'm sure you're seeing in the news, uh, many of our homes are burning. Some of our favorite places to be in nature are on fire. Um, we're, we're losing species at a really alarming rate, and not only the tiny and the quiet species, um, but in many cases, beings that are really part of our identities and our lives. So um, Joshua trees and the unique places that they live occupy a very, very special place in my heart, um, having grown up as a wild desert child. And you know, it's not at this point, it's not breaking news uh, to share with you that Joshua trees are threatened by human actions. Um, of course, the big aggregate monster is climate change. Um, in fact, studies show that within 100 years, we could lose all of the trees from places like Joshua Tree National Park. Um, but I'd be remiss not to mention that the threat of sprawling development and large scale solar uh, development projects also threaten Joshua trees. Um, there's the threat of invasive grasses um, uh, that become dry, um, spread throughout the deserts and they become dry. And then when you get lightning strikes, um, you know, you've got more fuel for the fires. Um, so that's another issue going on. In fact, recently a fire tore through uh, the Mojave Desert in the Sima Dome area and it took with it one of the largest and oldest uh, Joshua tree forests, well over a million trees. Uh, and, you know, and it's really just a reminder that we need to enact better protections to safeguard um, those, those species and organisms that we, that we do have. So fortunately, people have dedicated their life's work uh, to addressing these issues, such as Brendan Cummings. Um, he, he works with the Center for Biological Diversity. He filed a petition, as Eva mentioned, um, that begun a species review for Joshua trees to decide if they should get protection under endangered species law. Um, so the work that I do as a scientist directly contributes to decisions um, to see if Joshua trees will be granted endangered species protection. And if they do, oh, I'm sorry, excuse me. Let me close that window. <laughs> sorry about that. I live in Oakland, and so it gets really loud sometimes here. <laughs> oh. Okay, there we go. I'm back. <laughs> um, so, you know, so currently right now, Joshua trees are, are being um, reviewed to see if they will get endangered protection under the Endangered Species Act. And so my work as a scientist contributes directly to, um, to these kinds of policy, policy issues. And so if they do get this protection, it's really quite a big deal because Joshua trees are um, they're threatened by the climate, and if they get it, they'll be one of the first species in California to receive these kinds of protections under um, risks primarily due to climate change. Um, so it's a really big deal. So I'm going to share my research with you today in the spirit of the book Lab Girl, um, which we've been, which is kind of the inspiration for all of these uh, discussions that have been happening. And um, it's, it's a bit of a, uh, it's a change from the way that I usually give talks. So you're gonna kind of get to see the inside um, take on how I navigated my research process and how the art and the science come together um, more in, in a, a, an abbreviated play-by-play. -play. So let me open up my, okay. Great. Okay. Um, so I grew up in the desert community near Joshua Tree National Park and, you know, I remember running through the rocks in the park back in, back in the day when we used to call it a monument. Um, I definitely did not expect to return to the desert to study ecology for my dissertation work. Um, I had been drifting back and forth between dual careers in science and art. I'd been working in the tropics uh, and, you know, I finally decided to give, to dive in and give science my full focus for my PhD. So one day early in the program, uh, my lifelong mentor uh, and I, Robin Kabali, who Eva mentioned earlier, um, she's an incredible desert plant researcher who currently found, uh, who founded the Power of Plants. So I recommend you check that out. Um, but we are catching up at the Big Morongo Canyon Preserve um, in uh, near Joshua, the Joshua Tree area. And I was working in a fungal lab at UC Santa Cruz at the time, and I was trying to figure out what to study. And you know, Robin is an avid fungal enthusiast, and she really lit a fire for me to focus on a certain kind of fungi called mycorrhizae, mycorrhizal fungi. So let me tell you about this, this fungi. Um, mycorrhizal fungi are really fascinating 
and they form a symbiotic kind of relationship with plant roots. And these fungi, oftentimes you, you can't see them, sometimes you can, um, so they can be microscopic and they grow in these vast underground uh, webs and networks under the soil where the fungi go through and they forage for soil nutrients and water. And in exchange, um, they pass it back up to the plant through the roots uh, in exchange for plant sugars. And so in this image, the example is all of that white fuzzy stuff is the mycorrhizae, and it has that, symbiotic, that symbiotic relationship with the plant roots. Um, plants that form these kinds of relationships, they grow bigger, stronger, better, faster. Um, they're more resilient against uh, pests and diseases. Um, it's, it's a pretty, pretty amazing uh, symbiotic relationship. And they can even, underground, they can even transmit information in some systems where plants can pass information through these underground fungal networks to other plants. Um, this, is, this is pretty new work, so it doesn't uh, mean that it works for all plants, but in some cases it does happen. It's pretty, pretty wild. So, um, let's see, oh, so I was, uh, at the time, so at the time I was planning on working at the tropics and I was, I was taking all of this information together about the mycorrhizae and I was thinking about what I could do. I dove into um, reading about all of the breaking research on this kind of fungi to figure out what kind of questions I could come up with for my dissertation work. I was thinking about working in agricultural systems and um, just really, really, you know, had to do a deep dive into where the field was for this kind of fungi. And so six months later, um, you know, I'm catching up on all of this breaking fungal research and crafting all kinds of research questions around plant fungal interactions. And um, I was taking a break and reading plain old National Geographic in my backyard. And I came upon an article um, by Cameron Barrows, who's a local desert ecologist. And he had uh, written about, uh, he'd written a really important article about the threat of climate change onto Joshua trees. So I went on a tangent reading all about Joshua trees um, for fun, you know, while the real work of my dissertation waited. And um, at that time, it was, it was breaking news that Joshua trees were threatened by climate change and that they'd have a really hard time surviving in the desert area, area where I'm from. And so that really hit me hard. That really hit me to the heart. Um, and so then the simple obvious question occurred to me at that point, which was, you know, what's going on with the Joshua tree mycorrhizal fungi? I actually, I actually wrote it down. So this is my, um, my lab notebooks at the time. I wrote it down and um, I just, I went back to kind of look for that for this talk today and it made me laugh. And so this, this question here kind of kickstarted my whole dissertation. Um, so, you know, so I started searching um, to see who had been doing work on Joshua trees and their mycorrhizal fungi. And what's amazing is that we didn't even know if they, if Joshua trees made these kinds of associations, these kinds of relationships. Um, there was really nothing about it. And so my first job was to just go dig up some Joshua tree roots and see if they had this kind of fungal association. So this is uh, a tree from my, my um, childhood backyard. And um, I went out and I dug up some of these roots. And, uh, you know, for, for some of the different kinds of these kinds of mycorrhizal fungi, you can't necessarily just look at the roots and see if it has this association. So I had to take them back to the lab and do a bunch of science stuff to it and, um, you know, boil the, boil the roots and dye them with things. And it took a number of days so I could ask these questions and just, and just figure out are the trees even forming these kinds of associations? And it turns out that they are, and they're actually, that there is tons of this fungi in the soil. So let me tell you what you're looking at. Um, this is a microscope slide of Joshua tree roots, and this big oblong shaped thing is a plant root cell in the Joshua tree roots, and this dark blue stuff is the mycorrhizal fungi. Um, it stains dark blue with the, with the um, chemicals that I was using. And so, um, the, as you can see, the dark blue fungus fills those root cells and then it grows up. It's kind of got that arm-like shape that uh, is growing out and it forges for, you know, it can grow out into the soils or it can uh, infect other plant root cells. So, um, the fact that it has so many fungal associations inside of the roots mean that it could be really, really important for Joshua trees. Um, so if you read the book Lab Girl, uh, you know, this was really my opal moment that she talks about. Um, it was super exciting. And, um, 
so right then I, I had the beginning of my questions for my dissertation research. And so, you know, now the work really starts. Um, so yes, they form fungal associations, but what kinds of fungi are there? Um, is it just one kind of fungi they're associating with? Is there more? Uh, is it even doing anything for the plants? And do those relationships change with the climate? Like what's that piece going on? So um, I discussed these ideas with my advisor uh, who you know, has the role of my science guru uh, in a PhD program. And he says, oh, you can't just study Joshua trees without studying the moth because Joshua trees have a really, really fantastic relationship with the little teeny tiny moth pollinator. Um, so now I had to get into moths as well as Joshua trees, uh, but it was, it was fantastic. So let me tell you about this little moth. So this moth is about the size of an apple seed and it is the only pollinator for Joshua trees. Um, and this little tiny moth, um, it also, what's so fantastic is it's one of the only examples of purposeful pollination in all of the world. Fig trees do it too, but, but not much else. Um, and so this little moth collects pollen and she takes it. And so you see this little moth inside of a Joshua tree flower and she's taking the pollen and she's pushing it down into the flower. And that's purposeful pollination right there. Um, she's actually purposefully pollinating the flower. And then um, what she does next is she oviposits. So she lays her eggs, let's see. She lays her eggs inside of the flower and what she's done is she made sure that that flower is going to um, develop into Joshua tree fruit and the seeds inside of that fruit are gonna become food for her developing babies, her uh, moth larva. Um, and so it's, it's a really, really uh, incredible symbiotic relationship. Again, so you've got the symbiosis between the moth and the, the tree and then the fungus in the tree. And so kind of to put that together, um, so after she, after that mo that tree is pollinated and you end up with seeds, that seed needs to find a nice spot to land on the ground. It needs to put down some roots and sprout, and then it becomes a little baby Joshua tree and it's there that it encounters all of the underground mycorrhizal fungi that I've um, drawn as a little tangle right there. And then um, the Joshua tree uh, begins its journey to, to survive, which is rough in the desert. Um, so. I wanted to know, you know, does Joshua tree success depend on moth success? What do those numbers look like um, across the across a climate gradient in the national park? And how do Joshua tree populations change? So over two years, um, as marked by a pregnancy, um, and then later my my little one came along with me. You can see I'm climbing up a ladder there while pregnant, leaning over very sharp things, um, setting some moth traps, and then uh, the next year around, I've got. I've got my little field assistant with me. So we collected, we collected a lot of data, we counted moths, we counted trees, we measured trees, um, these are what ecologists do, and uh, collected soil to analyze the fungal communities. And so what I found um, after a whole lot of data collection and even some DNA sequencing work is firstly that Joshua trees go really well at some locations on the climate gradient. So um, this little hill represents low to high elevation, uh, which is a proxy for climate. And um, you'll see in the middle area, there are lots of trees, lots of flowers, and lots of moth pollinators. Um, and that led to lots of seeds being produced. Uh, but, but down at the very bottom, down at the lowest and warmest locations, not many trees were surviving and, or thriving. And so, at, and at both the warmest and the coolest locations, so up at the top of there, um, even the trees that would, would flower, um, I actually wasn't finding any moths at either the hottest or the coldest locations. And so no moths mean no seeds, and so there was no sexual reproduction happening there. Um, this means that Joshua trees cannot reproduce by seed at the highest elevations as they would need to do if they're gonna move up and track, um, track, move up in elevation as the, uh, in response to climate change. So this has really big implications for thinking about Joshua tree survival uh, with the rapidly changing climate. Um, so now thinking about the fungi, the underground fungi. So with the DNA sequencing, which is how I found and looked for different fungal communities, I found that there was a whole bunch of different kinds of fungi in the soil. So again, I've shown them by little squiggles. Um, and they're all different colors, meaning that um, different, different fungal groups, different kinds of species. And I found that the fungi group and species along a climate gradient, um, so from low to high, so there is a pattern there. 
Oops. Um, and and so, okay, so there are different kinds of fungal species in in um, the areas where I was studying them, but you know, are they doing anything to the tree? How do we know that they even matter? So I uh, drew a bunch of Joshua tree seedlings and I added fungi from across the elevation gradient to them to see what would happen. And I found that the, the fungus actually do impact the trees um, they, and the trees do behave differently with different kinds of fungi. So some fungi were really better at absorbing nutrients and that led to more seedling growth. Um, and these relationships could get really complicated. So um, I've just kind of shown that here with the, the different colors so you can see some of the different growth patterns. Um, you know, and these relationships are important to the tree and important to understand how the relationships could change with the changing climate, especially considering that the seedling stage is so um, crucial to survival when you live in the hot and dry desert. And so when we are considering Joshua trees and survival and climate change, we really need to be thinking about all of the important species uh, that are interacting with the plant. So while I was up to my ears answering all of these questions as a scientist, um, you know, out there doing the ecological sampling and, you know, quite honestly, grueling lab work uh, to decode the fungal DNA, I was also having a baby. Um, but I was also fully engaging in arts practice uh, to investigate Joshua tree symbiosis using different tools, uh, because truth be told, um, I think I'm really an artist first and a scientist second, which I've only really recently been able to admit that to myself. Um, and while those two, you know, those two, the science and the art do feed back and forth to each other, um, and I do identify as both, I think the, the artist part of me is a little bit stronger. Um, you know, I, so the core of my work, I'm really interested in how an arts practice that is informed by ecological research can impact social change. Uh, you know, we've got a ton of science telling us what's wrong, um, what we're doing wrong on this planet and what we could be doing better, yet we still don't seem to be able to make the kinds of changes that we need. And that's fundamentally because we need some cultural shifts, some major cultural shifts. We need to get people to care and to start to shift some of those uh, deeply embedded unsustainable practices. Uh, you know, as I mentioned before, the extreme, our extreme consumerism and resource extraction. And we've got to decentralize some of our ideas of human exceptionalism. And so I think art is, is a profoundly important path forward uh, together with science, and it will help us um, move towards a more sustainable future. So bringing the science and art together in my work. Um, as you can imagine, the fungal data that I've been describing can get really, really complex. So I've transformed my ecological findings and the DNA sequencing data into conceptual and data-driven artworks. Um, and with that, I've also been developing a new method of painting where I manipulate the physical properties of paint. And then I get these really incredible soil-like organic patterns, um, some of which you're seeing in this painting here, that create roots and fungi, like what I find in my underground field sites um, and under a microscope. I really wanted to draw attention to the beauty and complexity of the processes that are happening all around us um, all of the time. And, you know, it's really, really important when we're thinking about how to maintain functional and functioning ecosystems for the species that we're concerned with. Um, so my studio is definitely a place of experimentation. Um, so to tease out and play with and experiment with my painting materials, um, I, I also incorporate elements of my study organisms into the work. I extract uh, seed oil from Joshua tree seeds that I use to mix into the paints um, to get the paint to do these kinds of organic um, shapes and processes that I'm seeing. I use alcohol and um, soap uh, also to kind of deconstruct some of the, the paint properties. Um, I've done a ton of experimenting to get the, the kind of textures to evolve in this work. Um, I've made a, a ton of terrible artwork, which is really brutal when you're paying for, for childcare um, to sit around making bad paintings all day and when your dissertation's not getting written and the science is, is sitting. But um, I felt that deep burning that I had, I had something that I needed to both discover and create um, that was kind of critical to um, my process. So took lots and lots of notes. Um, and eventually I started to get down a reproducible pattern. And so in um, terms of the, the conceptual work in the paintings, I take all of my science data and I turn it into charts um, and I, it becomes a, a sort of a coding, almost like an algorithmic process. Um, and with that, I use all of this data to inform the selection of colors and shapes in my artworks. 
And um, that helps me to drive some of the aesthetic decision making. And so moving through an exhibition of these paintings would be like moving through the climate gradient in the field where I work. Um, the colors change with soil chemistry and temperature. Um, the different patterns and shapes represent different fungal species. So I turn to and restitch the canvas to create these symbolic um, representations of the fungal symbiosis. And these, these symbiotic representations also speak to the tension inherent to species interactions because there's a, there's a really incredible, um, sometimes they're beneficial and sometimes they're harmful depending on what's happening uh, with the local environmental conditions, um, so the climate. But this, this stitching I do, you know, it also inv evokes the tensions between ecosystems and humanities uh, and humanity. And part of my practice is to mend these broken ecosystems through the stitching and the care that I'm giving them in these artworks. The stitching patterns also change to correspond to different fungal species. Um, so for example, this is a low elevation painting with warm colors and high fungal density with fungal species that have complex branching patterns and lots of soil hyphae. Um, which are parts of the fungi. And again, the colors correspond to data like pH and elevation and temperature. This is a higher elevation piece with the cooler colors coming in and the changing fungal species um, in the, and different stitching patterns and different densities. So I even use Joshua tree fibers, um, which are from the Joshua tree spines, like the leaves, um, to stitch into the canvas that I make by teasing apart those spines. And so you see that. Um, that's being used to stitch this work. And this is actually a, a recent painting. And so this is some of the, the most uh, current direction I'm taking where I've pushed my collaborations with Joshua trees even further. Um, and I actually let the Joshua tree root growth patterns drive decisions um, in the placement of the fungal interactions on the paintings. And so the shapes and the patterns of the root are taken uh, from images that I've actually taken of Joshua tree roots growing in glass viewing chambers. And um, that's, that's how I decide where to put everything in the, in the different image. And um, again, I, I work into that, the fungal stitching patterns and then the decisions of colors um, are much like the others. And then you've got the, um, I paint Joshua tree individuals um, in some of my work as well, like this one. And these are from actual real Joshua trees that are at my field sites. And so the trees that you would encounter in these locations. Um, with these different fungal species that are happening in this specific spot on a climate gradient. And in this one, um, for this one, I'm, I'm continuing to experiment with some um, ideas with materiality and you know, really pushing my materials. So this is a layered painting and it draws on um, a layered painting and drawing that I've done on multiple sheets of translucent vellum paper. Um, and this allows me to experiment with bringing different areas into focus while fading some into the background. Um, so this is another way that I, I you know, invite us to explore ideas of loss um, with the Joshua tree. So you'll see there's a surprising transparency to the work. You can actually see through it. Um, and again, there's multiple, um, multiple pieces of this together in one stack. So, um, so as I said, these Joshua trees are inspired by real trees from my field sites. Um, and those trees are actually part of the next project I'm gonna show with you. So I've created a dating site. This is a, a playful work where you can meet Joshua trees from my field sites. I wanted to um, have a, a way for more people to interact with the work I was doing. So Hey J Tree is a mock online dating site and it's a curatorial art project where you can meet uh, and interact with Joshua Trees at my field sites. Um, with this work I wanted, you know, I wanted a more interactive project, wanted to be able to collaborate and share it with more people and really explore some ideas around Joshua Tree loss. So you go to the website and you pick a favorite tree and you click on it and um, You'll find that there's the ecological data from my field sites, but there's also there's a dating style profile written by um, uh, guest writers. There's music videos from different musicians, um, some local from the desert area, uh, others from the Bay Area. And uh, it's also linked with public school lesson plans. There's a scavenger hunt where you can actually go visit your tree in the desert. Um, go make a pilgrimage to your tree. You can take a picture. Um, this is some, some folks went out and found, found the tree. And you can also 
participate by sending your tree, um, your favorite tree, a love letter, and it gets posted to the, the website. And so each tree kind of builds up a following in that way. So I share the, the Hey J Tree project uh, across community events and music festivals, and I do this work with schools. There's also a printmaking component where each tree has a hand-carved image made by different artists um, who collaborated with me, and people can make relief prints of their favorite tree and take it home and look it up online, um, and again, then start to interact with the tree. I found that people really connect to the work and the Joshua Tree story on a deeper level by participating in these community experiences and this physical action of creating the print um, and learning about the Joshua Tree. And I, and I start to hear you know, a lot of language of people referring to it as their tree, like this is my tree, um, and, and telling me about, uh, it just kind of builds that familiarity um, and that care into thinking about Joshua Trees. I also do this work with children. Um, in this case, I don't frame it so much as a dating site, as more of a pen pal site. So I've taken groups of school kids out to the National Park as part of an artist residency that I had through the park. And um, we went out and drew trees from my field sites um, and then went back to the classroom and created prints with the, with the students and they wrote little letters to their trees. Um, so bringing this all together, an attempt to put some of these mini layers together uh, and, to, and to continue to broaden my reach, I've created an animation about my research. So this stop motion animation is part of an art science residency I've had through the National Park, through Joshua National Park, and also through Open Lab at Santa Cruz. Um, I was aiming to demystify the research process and what scientists can look like. So in this case, you've got a mother with a baby doing field research. You know, there's no lab coats. Um, the, the animation, I decided to set it to cello music uh, soundtrack as opposed to kind of a didactic narrative uh, because I wanted people to have their own experience and take of the animation and just um, just kind of let the imagery tell the story. Um, but I'll, I'll give you the brief overview. So the animation, the story follows my son and I through the National Park um, doing research and you get to dive into the underground world and see the fun fungi growing and see what they look like when they grow, um, you know, in, under microscopic in microscopic spaces and into root cells and you see the complexities of moth pollination all of these things that are really hard to actually witness in the field or witness scientifically um, and that the the research character um, who is me <laughs> uh, and you can see it's taken from taken from life there um, they find that something's wrong with the trees and so she ends up having this nightmare uh, which gives her an idea to move the trees up into a higher location in the mountains and then you flash forward to 90 years later, and the little boy has grown into an old man. Um, the trees are all gone from that area in the park, but uh, he journeys up the mountain to find the trees, um, and, and they're, they've made it, they've survived, they're still growing where they transplanted them, and the moths also went with them, so they have their symbiotic species. And so, you know, I've got a happy ending to this little, this short little animation, um, but there's many hidden questions and metaphors in this work. You know, namely, should we be moving these trees? Um, that's a big, big issue that comes up in ecology is, um, is should we be moving species into areas to track the changing climate? Um, should we be caretaking at this level? And, um, you know, uh, what kind of problems are going to rise in the new ecosystems as we do it? So, um, so there's a lot to explore there. Uh, and, you know, also the idea that within a hundred years, if we lose all the trees from places like the National Park, I mean, that's, that's my son's lifetime. So I'm, I'm out there doing this field work in the park and it really hits hard for me thinking like, wow, a hundred years is a human lifetime. So this is another thing I could explore in this, in this artwork. Um, it involved collaborations with a, a whole team of artists to create all of the needed characters and sets and props and dolls. I worked with a really amazing um, doll maker who apprenticed me to, to learn how to make these kinds of dolls years ago, uh, who lives in the desert, Dale McKinney, she's incredible. Um, and um, Lauren Binsequin helped me, helped me with the animation and uh, had a great team of folks working on this and the music. Um, we created these tiny hand-painted faces so you get all the nuances of character and emotion and um, Dale came up with this great idea to tie them on to the, the little dolls so you would get to change them out and you get uh, the nuances of the story. And we built these really elaborate sets and had all these pieces um, to, you know, create some of the work that I was actually doing out in the park. Um, and some of them were 
from much further distance. And so this is the idea that, you know, you're high up in Joshua Tree National Park and all of those little things down there are, are tiny little Joshua trees, which we actually made out of grape stems. Um, if you eat the grapes off a Joshua tree, or if you eat the grapes off of a grape stem, they look like little teeny tiny Joshua trees. So we embedded those and uh, it was another way to play with scale. Um, and then, you know, got some really fun nighttime shots with night, oh, nighttime in the desert is uh, one of my favorite experiences on the planet. If you've never done that, you need to go moonlit night out in the desert. And I built this giant moth uh, and flower um, like this big. So you could really act out the yucca moth pollination into the blossom and um, animate that in the story. And so that was really, really fun. And then again, um, by creating these, these little windows into this world, um, we were able to use clay and show you how the mycorrhizal fungi grows into and um, infects plant cells and begins this symbiotic process. And so here's a little screen grab of um, us, us behind the scenes. So, you know, we really need a cultural shift right now um, towards changes that is gonna decentralize humans um, and really, can help us deconstruct um, these ideas of human exceptionalism. Joshua trees are just one of the many species that are impacted by the changing climate, um, you know, given that we've entered into the sixth major extinction event on this planet. And so part of my role as an artist and a scientist is both to provide witness, but also to really go beyond just the artistic gesture. And I wanna to contribute to impacting and changing policy. Um, I also, really hope to ignite a collective response that inspires others to each bring their individual talents um, and to help impact the kinds of changes that we're going to need, we need to see in our communities. And you know, this work, um, this kind of work is not accomplished as a solo hero's journey, um, but it's really a community endeavor that we need to embark upon to caretake our planet, um, this planet that we share with so many organisms. It's really truly an urgent time to make the kinds of radical decisions that value the environment and value equity and, and diversity. So um, that's it for my talk. I'd like to thank um, Eva and Marie for putting all this work together. Um, I also want to throw out a quick teaser that I'm about to start a really exciting art, uh, art residency that brings together science, art, and policy in ways that have never happened before. Um, I can't officially announce the organization yet, but it's going to make a really big splash. So if there's any curators out there listening and interested, please reach out to me so I can share some of those ideas and exhibition um, potential. And um, that's it. So I'm going to I'm gonna stop sharing. Well, thank you. That was just fabulous. And uh, really, really applaud your work. I know at the end of Lab Girl, uh, there is a plea for everybody to start planting trees. So I, I have so many questions. So I'm gonna, I'll start in with a few, but then I know we are also getting some questions from our viewers. Um, I wanna in particular talk about Joshua trees because they're very difficult to transplant I and mean, we've tried and there <clears throat> i know of not that many success stories but i see that you were able to sprout so many and i don't know what age those little trees were that you showed us so many of but uh, is there something that we can do as a community to plant more joshua trees just in our own environments yeah good question um so joshua trees are are interesting to sprout. I found there's a trick. Um, if you take the seeds and you you soak, uh, you put them in paper towels, some some wet paper towels, and put them in the dark um, for a day. They really like that. And so there's this, you know, seeds have different things that cue them. It might be getting really cold or having this dark um, this darkness. So put it in the dark for a day or two, and then take them out and put them in the sun and um, keep them in that, that moist paper towel and they will like just about all sprout. It's pretty incredible. Um, and then you can transfer, you can put them in soil, um, pick out the healthy ones, put them in some soil and then grow them up. So Joshua trees grow really slow. Um, I, in terms of transplant success, um, I know that sometimes it can be really difficult to transplant into the wild. So like at the national park, they have big, um, greenhouses where they're growing Joshua trees to do that kind of restoration work out in, in burned areas when the fires come through and burn. Um, also, you know, potentially thinking about future transplanting into different areas perhaps. Um, but the survival rate isn't great. And I don't know if that's in those burned areas, if they're 
you know, there's also a bigger story with what's happening underground with the mycorrhizal fungi. Perhaps those fungal communities aren't um, ideal after the burns because that definitely changes soil structure. Um, but so yeah, that's another interesting area that I'm exploring uh, moving forward. And another thing to consider is that like, um, a big issue is the major transplanting of trees, which is being done as some of the, you know, some of the requirements under um, development and um, with these solar, big solar companies, they're supposed to transplant giant Joshua trees, but their roots come out and they go really, really far. And to consider, you know, how much you'd have to dig up to get a successful transplant. In some cases, they transplant and they survive for a while. And so you might, um, you know, they might appear to continue to live for a few years, but from, there hasn't been uh, any great studies done on how long things are actually lasting, but um, from the word on the street is that uh, after a number of years that those big ones don't make it. And then, you know, many once you transplant them, they just, they just don't, they don't last very long at all. Um, so thinking about future scenarios, like people growing Joshua trees is a great idea in their backyards, you know, growing them in pots. And just if we had many, many, many thousands of Joshua trees on hand and ready to transplant into areas in the wild where they could survive, um, you know, as a call to arms later, like that, that could be a really great idea. So um, I encourage people growing trees. Uh -huh. So at, at our site, we're growing a lot of uh, mesquites and palo verdes because we're <clears throat> sort of focused on the food you know, a way to kind of feed people and a tree that grows very long tap roots and so forth. What would the ecological benefit of Joshua trees be to a desert community? Oh, um, well, you know, you think about out in the desert, um, Joshua trees are some of the, the tallest trees out there in many of the locations. So that, that creates in a really hot desert environment, kind of a little microclimate and um, a little island of sorts um, for, for insects and organisms and all different kinds of organisms to um, to participate in and also take advantage of that microclimate and that space. Um, so that's that's one big thing. You know, it does provide shade, um, but then there's lots of organisms that that um, interact with the Joshua tree. I mean, the yucca moths are an obvious one. That's a co-evolved symbiotic one. But there's like the the shrike is a bird that will impale and spear. Um, lizards on the ends of the Joshua tree spikes um, to come back and eat them later. And, um, you know, jackrabbits will um, chew at and gnaw at the, the base of Joshua trees to get some water out of them. And you've got, all the, you know, the, the pods are also edible and animals will eat those as well. And so they, they do absolutely um, participate in the larger ecosystem. Can people eat the pods? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep, you can, you can. Have you eaten them? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're weird, but you know, they're, they're exciting to eat too. When um, they're green, is that right? You eat them when they're green? Uh, you can take them, and say so you'd want to take them when they're when beyond, beyond the green, um, and so you can pound them flat and smash them, kind of make like a fruit leather. Mm, oh, great. Mm -hmm. And so we had somebody ask the question too, just on the same subject, when you're transplanting, does it help to take a little bit of soil that's already in, on your site and add it to the mix when you're Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I would, I would think, um, you know, trying to encourage some of those local fungal communities. When you, if you were to think about like planting with um, um, a store-bought succulent planting mix, um, even if it says it has mycorrhizae in it, it's a totally different strain of mycorrhizae um, and some fungi can act antagonistically um, the whole world of mycorrhizal soil fungi is kind of this um, exploding field of lots of unknowns and interesting, uh, interesting things we're learning about how they, how they work and what we didn't know. Because yeah, one of the things that Robin Gavali came and did a planting demonstration, we had a 100th birthday for Lou Harrison, and um, I learned from her that you don't really want to plant any uh, additional nitrogen manures or <clears throat> soils because it will prevent the tree from becoming part of the larger system. Is mm. that your experience as well? Hmm. I don't know. I would. I would. Um, I would go with Robin's opinion on that one. <laughs> she. She knows a ton. She also gave a great. Um, great idea once about. Um, taking care of your own little Joshua trees of, you know, if you're going to be watering them, which you don't really need to, um, you really want to mimic the, the natural pulses that we have in uh, the desert environment because, you know, you get those summer monsoons and um, you don't want to water them a ton or it'll just rot the roots. 
Oh, interesting. So also getting back to the book. Um, uh, so in the book, um, our, our lab girl had an assistant, Bill, throughout you know, her 20 years in the lab. And uh, have you had an assistant? Oh, I've had lots of, lots of different assistants. Um, I don't have a Bill. I love, I love Bill in the story. He's so great. And, you know, it was just a, like the whole kind of um, narrative really revolved around their relationship and um, their friendship. Um, I don't have that kind of story in my work. I've worked, but I've worked with so many just wonderful people. I would say the closest I come to that is my mom. She, um, she was my daily field assistant when I did my research out in the national park. Um, we definitely talk to each other like, like, um, Hope and Bill did in the, in the book. Very straight, um, straight to the point. Um, she, she was incredible. I mean, that was the whole reason I was able to be pregnant out, you know, in the desert sampling all day. My mom was holding the ladder, you know, um, dragging the ladder through the desert. She wouldn't let me carry it because I was, um, I was so pregnant. And then, you know, having my son, when he'd come down, there was always grandma to, to help and we'd all go out together. Um, if I missed doing some data collection, my mom was part of my my um, field permits. So she could go out and she could grab things and mail them to me. Um, yeah, she really, and you know, through that, she also had to learn all about the ecology and what we were doing. She was setting moth traps and just really full on assisting and everything and continues to assist with all of the um, scale of the art projects that I work on too and, and support that. So it's okay. pretty. So what else might have resonated uh, for you through the book? So, I mean, so unusual and timely for a book about a woman scientist and, you know, maybe it starts 30 years before now, maybe it's easier to be a woman now in the sciences, but what resonated for you with the book? Um, well, I, one, big, one big thing that was coming up for me with this book was uh, how, difficult it is to be a scientist and she uh, you know in some sense she she talks about how wonderful it is to be a scientist and how exciting the curiosity you know that that really drives me in my work it, it, as both an artist and a scientist is to be curious um, I'd say that's the big driving you know if you get to do work where where curiosity is what's driving you um, every day like that's so lucky and so that's why I'm a scientist um, but the, the actuality of being a scientist is really brutal. Um, you, there's the, you know, you're always chasing funding. It is insanely competitive. Um, the world of science PhDs, they are, you know, super smart, talented people. And you, you get a PhD and I think the number of available jobs are like 5%, um, which is crazy. And, you know, you, it's just, it's really hard. And so you're doing all of this work. You're supposed to come up with original questions and, you know, mm -hmm. find things that have never been done and write grants all day and write papers and review papers. And, and uh, it's just incredibly overwhelming and, and challenging at times. And I feel like she got into that um, a bit and really gave a, you know, the, she had one line in there where she said, and if anybody wants to fund me, please contact me. Um, it would be insane not to write this. And it made me laugh because it's like, yeah, it's true. Um, yeah. So, you know, that's, that's one thing. And I, I just, I really loved another thing in her book is I loved how uh, vulnerable she was in the work she was doing. And she really was human, you know. Um, it's another thing is I, I've been, go to many conferences and I meet all kinds of professionals and, um, you know, there's, there's this human side that you don't often get to see, which is something I really try and provide with the art that I do is, is bringing a, a more of a window into, you know, what a scientist can look like. And, um, as, you know, my reality, it's like a scientist mother, that's a very big part of my identity and, um, you know, working through this process as well. And I think also why I'm driven to do the work that I do is um, thinking about all of these things. Yeah. So I want to read one little paragraph from the book and see how this made you feel. Okay. We're talking about we're talking about um, making putting together all the equipment that's needed. The little section about you know making the scales and the spectrometer. It says that the creative process born from these necessities gives rise to delightfully quirky creations unique as their creators. Like all art, they are a product of their period and an attempt to address the issues of their age. 
also like art, they appear outmoded and antiquated when viewed from within the future that they helped create. So do you feel at some point that your work is going to be a history of what Joshua Trees were? Oh yeah, it, it all builds on, um, you know, science is constantly building on the, the previous story and um, it moves quickly, especially these days. Um, so I'm, I'm, you know, it kind of already is. I mean, I'm working on a paper right now that's out for review uh, with all of the, the fungal work that's going to be fairly new and exciting. But um, yeah, this stuff moves very quickly. And it's funny, the tools that you're using in the field too, like I remember reading that, that um, passage, it's you're, you're using things sometimes, especially considering, you know, money is always an issue. Um, you have to like duct tape things together and get them to work. Um, and yeah, it's, you know, sometimes you're using million dollar apparatuses that, um, you know, you get to ask some really exciting questions on, but oftentimes you're using really outdated things um, to get it to work. And, you know, it's part of, part of, part of being a scrappy scientist, I think. Yeah. So uh, one question, you sort of touched upon it, but um, uh, Wes Modes to, all, uh, to you, question from Wes, I'm always impressed by how many different forms of art practice you work in. What other secret things are you working on that we can look forward to in the future? <laughs> um, oh boy. Well, I've, I'm doing a lot of work right now uh, around fire. Um, and so that's, that'll probably be the next stuff that, that you see starting to come up. I mean, it's just been, I've been, you know, we're all stuck inside, um, here in the Bay Area. I live in Oakland. That's where I'm coming to you from right now. And the, the air quality has been so sad. Um, and you know, my families, I've had multiple family members had have to evacuate or been on evacuation watch. Um, this season with the fires, and as I mentioned before, you know, the, all the Joshua trees that were lost, and um, you know, and then Joshua tree communities, everybody knows that the fires have been terrible out in that area. I know you've had really, really rough um, mm -hmm. smoke, so it's been on my mind a lot. So I'm creating a series of works um, thinking about some of these issues, and those are illustrative. Um, Partly right now, what I'm doing is contained uh, a little bit by the, the fact that I also have a four month old baby. Um, so, you know, what I can, how I can wear her on me while I'm working, that's part of my day. Um, I have some really exciting um, performance and sculptural work that I'm considering uh, that I'd like to produce pretty soon. And so I don't think I'm going to tell you about it yet, though, because it's, it's around the corner. So you have to wait, Wes. Um, but, but, yeah, it's an exciting piece. So sorry, that's. <laughs> I know. Well, I, I, I mean, I think with, with somebody that kind of has the kind of curiosity and talent you have, there's always going to be something exciting coming around the corner. <laughs> um, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, well, thank you. I think I don't know if there's any other questions from other people. I have a million questions to tell you the truth, but I think you know our hour is about up. Is that right, Marie? How are we doing? She should be our timekeeper there. And I do want to encourage people to watch your film if they haven't already. It's on our website, lewharrisonhouse.org. And um, you know, at the Harrison House, we practice the science of permaculture, which is the science of creating human habitat. So I just want to maybe ask you to have, have one more opportunity because at the end of the book, the really plea from the author is for everybody to plant trees. That's our Instagram handle, make art plant trees. <laughs> but uh, you know, from your point of view, I mean, how urgent is it? Yeah, um, it's kind of a complicated question in, in many ways, you know, like, like planting trees is, is extremely important, but I also, uh, my, many of my family members work in like forestry management, uh, my brother and my sister with the, the forest fire issue. I mean, we, in many cases on, on a lot of the acres, we actually have way too many trees um, compared to how it used to be in California. And so you've got, um, you know, and a lot of that is because of the burn, burn suppression, the fire suppression. And so, um, yes, definitely plant more trees, but in the right places <laughs> and um, encouraging, encouraging, you know, smart and science driven um, forest management 
that that will help us uh, to get a handle on what's happening in the California fire scenario is incredibly important. Um, but that's a really good question. I could probably talk about it for a long time. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it, in terms of the desert environment, oh, yeah. we grew up, um, what should we be doing to to regenerate soils and 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 that you know create living environments? Um, planting natives. Absolutely. Plant lots of natives, which, um, you know, go to, uh, it sounds like you all have an incredible education program happening there. So I would encourage people to learn about how to plant natives through what you're doing, but also Robin Caballi's, uh, Robin Caballi teaches native plant classes and landscape and gardening. Um, and if you look up power of plants that, I mean, that's why I'm a botanist, to be honest. My dad was a, was a landscaper, um, an amazing, you know, plant lover, um, but also, you know, you, you don't want to grow up and be your parents when you're kids. So um, when I met Robin, she really inspired me to, um, the, on this field of botany, she was a botanist and um, she teaches these classes and she'll light a fire for you to um, do this kind of stuff. So I would, I would look her up too. I, and, you know, I've taken every one of her classes oh. I possibly can. <laughs> yeah, and she's totally been an inspiration. Well, thank you so much. What a pleasure. And I look forward when times are better to have you come down to our residency and, and uh, be part of what we do. We're just steps away from the National Park. So we're all really concerned. Yeah, great. And, thank you so much, Eva. Thank you so much, Marie, for all the work that you've done uh, bringing everybody together for these. Yeah. Thanks, Marie, so much. Thank you both so much. And I have to say, I encourage everyone to look at the classes that are coming up in the spring at Harrison House Music Arts and Ecology. Uh, there's going to be a two week permaculture course. And for those of you who maybe can't commit the two weeks um, or are intimidated, there's also an introduction to permaculture that'll be a weekend course. Um, so if you're local to Joshua Tree, or even if you're not and you want to come out, um, I recommend looking at those. They're on the lewharrisonhouse.org website. Uh, and then again, just to remind everybody, if you'd like to look at some more Big Read programs, we have performances happening next weekend. And we also have two exhibitions that are available online. Uh, one is being the Wildlife, which was an exhibition uh, that was created in partnership with the Black Rock Art Gallery in Yucca Valley, that's part of the Joshua Tree National Park Art Gallery, as well as the Copper Mountain College Desert Bounty Student Show. So thank you for joining us. Thank you, Eva. Thank you, Juniper. And have a wonderful weekend. Bye-bye.